Good morning, church family. We're going to go ahead and open up with some worship here. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. You are my lighthouse, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. Shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. And I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. I won't fear what tomorrow brings. With each morning I'll rise and sing. My God's love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Far before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Far before us. You're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Hey, far before us. You're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Far before us. You're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. My lighthouse. My lighthouse. Shining in the darkness. I'll follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, and I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Amen. Amen. And you guys can go ahead and uh, the kids can be released now to go down to their classrooms. You guys can, uh, everybody greet at least one person you didn't ride in the car with on the way here. <laughs> right. And then Carlo will give us announcements. <laughs> Talk to everybody, but but Norm. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah, that's all right. It helps that like, the county is the same. Yeah, yeah. Like, right. To, like, just kind of like, Let's go from there. I'm like, all right, we're still going. Do, 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 do. Oh. Yeah, I went uh, a couple of years ago with, wow. my, with my job. My, really? my job is online, and so we 
don't really get to hang out with each other. So once a year, they pay for us to go and stay somewhere tropical. Like it's Cancun or it's the Caribbean. Wow. So I've been to the Caribbean twice and once to Cancun. I know I'm never traveling. So now once a year. I get a once a year thing, so I save a little bit each month so that I can you know, Yeah, so I can have a little bit of fun, get a few fun little things and you know and sometimes I'll upgrade my room so I get like a full view and I kinda of plan for it. Right. Yeah. I know. So what what are you doing? I work for a company called Chess checks like uh, oh, okay. palms right. and things right. and, and I'm in the middle of my role kind of changing but I mostly work with the people uh -huh. on the side so I help them oh. kind of use it and but I'm going to start helping the school and the coaches and the teachers more since I was a teacher so I'm going to start transitioning more into that and doing less of the customer service and more of the school integration cool. I know it should be good yeah cool. yeah Right now I do a lot of billing, so refunds and trying to get people to come back and like join the program and you know it's a lot of but yeah. they treat me well. Yeah. Yeah. Well that's it's that's a kind, good. It's a kind company where that's they're yeah. they're pretty family oriented. Uh, so they, yeah, they pay for us to go on a trip once a year so that awesome. we can yeah. all collaborate, right? Like, come up with ideas and see each other and try to improve yeah. this and that. Yeah, I never thought I would do this, but I'm like, I get to see my husband more, I get to go do things with friends, I get to see my mom, I get life again. I know, <laughs> my life has always been the opposite, like lots of work and then a little bit of life sprinkled around it. Now it's like life and the work sprinkled around it. I know, I'm like, it's taken me years to get to this point. What the heck are we doing? This is the longest like music break ever. Uh, I guess so just oh Carlos gonna come up and do this. Oh, okay. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Oh, <laughs> All right. I've got a couple announcements for you guys. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Starting tomorrow night, so is moving to a new home. That home is my home. <laughs> so if you don't know where it is, you can come and talk to me after service. As, first of all, so is for the ladies. We gather, we just soak on the word of God. We get together, we pray, we read scripture, and we just see what the Lord has for us, what he wants to say. And it's a very sweet time. So we are meeting at my house starting tomorrow night from now on. My address is in the bulletin, but it's 3603 Oak Street. So there the whole internet has it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's super simple to find. It's the first uh, blue house on the left on your way to Freddy's. Super simple. Um, Tuesday mornings, we have Moms in Prayer. We meet here at the church at 8.30. That is a time where we gather um, for, this is for moms, this is for aunts, this is for anybody who wants to get together and just pray for the kids in our community, pray for our teachers, pray for homeschool moms, anything to do with a school age group. So that would be principles, all of that. So we just get together. We pray for one hour. We're pretty um, set on the time. So we start at 8.30 pretty, pretty uh, uh, routinely. Um, um, <laughs> and we pray for about an hour. And then Tuesday night at 6.30, we have youth group here at the church. Woo! That is, yeah, woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. That is for <laughs> our junior high and high schoolers. That is for anyone, any kid. You don't have to just be uh, coming to our church. This is for anybody. So if you have neighbors, friends, um, people at Safeway, just invite them. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday nights is Kids Midweek. That is something that we are super blessed to be a part of over at Crossroads. We get to partner with them where our elementary age kids go and just have another time of learning about God and Jesus and uh, what it's like to walk with the Lord together. And so that is at 6.30 on Wednesday nights at Crossroads. 
Thursday is men's study at 6.15 in the morning. Then we have a prayer meeting at 9 a.m. And then we have a council meeting this Thursday at 6 p.m. at night. And then we have on February 4th, we are having our church family meeting and a potato potluck, which nice. is my favorite Ooh. kind of potluck. So the potatoes will all be provided. You guys get to bring your favorite toppings. And if it's a question, if bacon is too much, it's never enough bacon. So. Potato <laughs> bar. And that is on February 4th, directly after service. And then finally, we are updating our church directory. If you guys haven't given me your new information, or even if you were in the directory before, we're just doing a whole new fresh new one because we have so many fresh new faces, and this is just gonna update everything, get everything streamlined and current, and I will be in the back of the foyer after service to gather your information if you haven't already done that. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. And everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Shine your light Shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King. Lord Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Lord Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. 
Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. As we continue in worship this morning, we just invite you to find a posture that reflects what is in your heart. So if you would like to stand or sit or come kneel at the altar or raise your hands or just be quiet before the Lord, be free. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness, what a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning The everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leading, leading. Safe and secure from all alarms Leading, leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our rest. To the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Find a solace there. What a friend we have in Jesus. And all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. And all because we do not care. What a friend we have in Jesus. 
Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. because of your name, because of what you have done, Lord. We are here to hear from you. As Tim opens up the word this morning as um, your heart to us is poured out in this love letter that you have given to us, Lord. We're reminded who we're listening to, Lord, you. 
You're mighty, you are great, but you are love. So, oh, expectantly, we are here today to hear your word, Lord. Please help us to hear what you have for us, to take it, to run with it. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here with you all. It's good to be able to lift up the name of Jesus with you here this morning. And, um, you know, the Bible says that there's uh, only one name by which we're saved, and that's the name of Jesus. Um, before we jump into our, our time in the Word today, um, I... Just in the way the weekend worked, I didn't have a, a, a chance to get an update on the prayer chain uh, going. I wanted to let you know um, that at 12.30 Saturday morning, uh, Daniel Maynard passed away and stepped into glory uh, to be with his Heavenly Father. And man, I'm going to miss that guy. And uh, so right now, uh, you're uh, welcome to surround uh, Sheila and Stogie as they're working through some of the details and managing uh, what to do now that he's gone. Uh, but I'd just like to take a moment and pray for them uh, and then for, uh, for others who, who might be facing similar losses or, or that kind of thing. Uh, Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus, knowing that there's no other name by which we're saved, and God, that uh, Daniel trusted in you. Uh, God, through every high and low in his life, and even in, in coming back in recovery from, from all kinds of things, God, uh, he put his faith and his trust in you. Um, I remember all kinds of conversations with Daniel where he he shared with me he was just really ready to go home and be with you. And so, Jesus, I thank you for that promise and that hope that we have in you, that uh, by faith uh, in your name and in, in the blood that you shed for us on the cross, God, we have this promise of eternity with you and being in your presence. And so, God, I thank you that Daniel gets to enjoy that. Right now, we're, we're feeling the loss and we're feeling the grief that is there when a loved one who we've loved for quite some time is not there anymore. And so, God, I pray that you would be a comfort to Sheila and Stogie in this time. God, that you would, uh, that you would surround them with a godly community, with godly family to, uh, to encourage them uh, to speak uh, your truth and, and your comfort into their life, and also just to be with them and to be a, 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 an actual representation of your presence with them. Uh, God, as we, as we as a community mourn the loss of Daniel, we remember uh, his sense of humor, uh, his uh, fun ways of dressing up for certain holidays and things uh, because he could and he, he really liked doing that. And God, he loved bringing uh, smiles to everybody's faces and being able to just uh, be a light uh, even here. And so, God, I, I thank you for that. And I just pray that as we process through this loss, God, that you would help us. Uh, Lord, I lift up those in our church family as well as in our community who are, are facing similar losses, and I ask that you would come alongside them too. God, help your church uh, open up its arms to people who are hurting and who, who need your presence with them. God, we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, <clears throat> everybody, we are continuing in a series titled Parables. Uh, uh, sometimes I come up with creative names for series. Sometimes I don't. This is one of those <clears throat> of the latter. So uh, we're continuing in our study through the Gospel of Matthew, and we've come to Jesus' second great discourse in the Gospel of Matthew. There are three, 
Uh, the first was the Sermon on the Mount. Now we're in the parables, and then there's some more parables at the end, and then there's some end times -y kind of stuff that's also at the end right before he's about to go to the cross. And so right now we're, we're kind of at the halfway point in Jesus' ministry where Jesus, he's been speaking to, he's been doing all kinds of speaking and healing ministries. He's been traveling around with his disciples, uh, preaching the kingdom and, and also demonstrating it with signs and wonders and healing uh, those who would either come across his path or people would know that, hey, here's this guy who actually moves in the power of God. I have a friend or a family member who's sick. I need to bring him to Jesus or, or her to Jesus and, and that kind of thing. And even people were so, had such faith in this that even some of them would reach out and, and take that step of faith to, to go to Jesus. And so here at this point in Matthew's gospel, uh, in this whole transition point. Uh, Jesus, he's teaching to a crowd from a boat, uh, and the crowd's all on, on the shoreline there, and uh, it's kind of a, a hillside kind of thing, and uh, he begins with the parable of the sower, but we didn't start there, because uh, there's a moment when Jesus tells the parable of the sower where the disciples who were with him they kind of had an aside moment and said, Jesus, why are you talking to them in parables? And Jesus explained why he did. And so we learned the big idea from that initial teaching was to figure out why does Jesus speak in parables? Why not just shoot it to us straight and, and let us figure it out from there? Well, it's because God chooses to work through ordinary means to reveal his extraordinary purpose. One of the key themes throughout the Gospel of Matthew, as well as through the parables, is the idea that the kingdom of heaven has arrived. It's here, it's now. Now, there, now we know some 2,000 years later that there's an element of it being both now and not yet, because it's not fully realized yet. But the purpose still remains that God wants to advance his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's why Jesus speaks in parables, because there's just a way in telling these different types of object illustration stories that just conveys the truth in a way that just shooting it to a straight wouldn't. And so then last week we looked at the parable of the sower which is one of very few that Jesus chose to actually give an explanation for. And that, that gives scholars kind of reason for, for question and debate and all kinds of things. And we're not going to go into a ton of that today other than just to acknowledge that that is happening. But last week, we learned that God's word produces life in hearts that are ready, prepared to receive it. Because what Jesus told in the parable of the sower is that the sower went out to sow some seed, and the, it was the same seed for all the different types of soil that Jesus mentions, and that really the big difference between all of the soils is that the final one, the good soil, had been prepared and was readied for the seed to be received. And so then the big question for us last time, and it kind of filters into what we're going to talk about today, is that are you ready to receive the seed? Are you ready to receive what God would have to say in your life? Seed being a metaphorical, you know, literary device kind of thing to talk about the nature of it. When God speaks to you, are you ready to actually listen, to both hear and actually follow through and to do what his word has said? That is the question before us today, because it has eternal implications for you and for me and for everybody. So today, uh, the title for today's message is really simple, just like it was last week, but it's really simple. It's Wheat and weeds. Haha, <laughs> I love it. Oh, you can go back to the last slide. So uh, that scripture reference up there is wrong. Uh, 
apparently I was not paying attention. And so we're in Matthew 13, but we're starting in verse 24. And the big idea for us today is that God's justice, go back, go back. Richard's at the ready, you guys. He wants to get to the word of God. Here we go. Okay, so here's the big idea from the parable that we're about to read and that Jesus also unpacks for us today is that God's justice at the end gives hope now. God's justice at the end gives hope now. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles then to Matthew 13. Uh, You can also follow along digitally on the screen or with your handy-dandy phone device. I just invite you not to watch the game while we're reading the word for sure, but if highlights pop up on a thing, you can at least acknowledge, yep, it's there. Okay. All right. Here we are, the parable of the weeds. Here we go. Verse 24. He, meaning Jesus, put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Skipping down to verse 36. Uh, This is when they've come in from talking to the crowds now. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That was Jesus' favorite title for himself, by the way. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father, He who has ears, let him hear. So before we jump into some of the explanation of what I've discovered throughout my week and wrestling through this, I want to preface what I found. First of all, there are some of you who hope I'm going to say certain things. And there are some of you who hope I won't say certain things. And I want you to know that I'm probably going to offend both of you in some kind of a way. Uh, Because, uh, frankly, I don't want to go beyond what's written. I don't want to go beyond just now there are ways that you can connect certain passages together to mean certain things. But in its purest form, if you and I were sitting at the feet of Jesus or sitting as a part of the crowd listening to Jesus, you know, declare this from a boat. I want to think about how we may have heard it if we were in their shoes before we jump then to how we apply that today. Because I think too quickly, there are people, well-meaning brothers and sisters in Christ who 
will take a passage like this and say, ah, ha, ha, I know exactly what this is about without doing the deeper work of asking certain questions. One primarily being, what would they have thought? If they had heard these words, what would they have thought? What would it have meant to them? And then, as a result of that, then crossing the bridge into, okay, now, as we hear these words, can we apply the same sort of feeling or, or interpretation of what they would have heard and what they would have sensed from Jesus declaring this parable, can we then apply it to where we're at today? And so I just want to give that, uh, that trigger warning, <laughs> that, that disclaimer, because uh, I know that there will be some of you who are disappointed by what I say, and there's some of you who will be like, oh. <laughs> or might be offended the other way around. And I think you can fill in the gaps in what I'm saying there. Now, let's unpack just for a moment the literal story. Now, like we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, Jesus uses these parables, these comparison type of stories to illustrate a certain truth. He's trying to convey a certain truth to different people um, about some eternal thing, and he's using a very real-life, tangible thing that they would have known about as well. And so he talks about, again, a sower going to sow some seed. They were a farming-type culture. They were used to this. Maybe they even participated in farming type of work things. And so they would have been familiar with the difference between what would be sowing wheat for grain and for bread and all, all the good things that you can get from wheat versus sowing weeds. And so what's fascinating about the literal story is that you have this sower, he has good seed. Again, nothing wrong with the seed. The sower, he goes out with the best intentions. He's a faithful sower. He goes out, he sows the seed in the whole field. And it's wheat seed, by the way. And then uh, time goes by and, you know, everybody goes in for the night. And then the enemy, I just imagined as I was reading this this week, I'm sure you've seen different shows like this. Usually it's a cartoon where there's like that pesky neighbor who's like standing over here and he's like creeping around. <laughs> creeping around, right? And then he goes to like, is anybody seeing? And I'm going to sow some seed. And, um, and so then, and then he gets out of Dodge and he's not there anymore. And I just, I had that picture in my head and I couldn't get it out. So there you go. There's my literal interpretation of the enemy going and sowing some seed. Now what's fascinating is that he sows the seed uh, in the midst of the field. Uh, we could interpret that in a way that would say that it was like literally smack dab in the middle of the field. Uh, what scholars think is that actually what that really means is that he went throughout the entire field and sowed these seeds of, uh, of weeds. And the big question there is, I know what weeds look like in my, in my lawn. I'm not as familiar because I didn't grow up as a farmer with weeds as you see them uh, in, in a pasture of, of wheat and, and that kind of thing in a field of wheat. And so evidently, there is this type of weed that looks strikingly similar through almost the entire process of it growing, like compared to wheat. It's like neck and neck. Everything is exactly almost so very close the same until it starts showing its fruit. Then you can start to see some of the signs of, oh, okay, it's developing this way. This is now this literal, this is that type of weed. It's called Darnell. Uh, after doing some research, it mostly is still active and, and present in Africa. But what is strange about Darnell, even though it looks strikingly similar in every single way to wheat, it's actually poisonous for us. And so uh, it's 
uh, such a, a strange, chemically, whatever type of, of almost grain that uh, people have used it for centuries as like a hallucinogen or something. And so even around the time of Jesus, there were people in uh, Greco-Roman cults and isms and things who would use Darnell uh, to get some kind of a, a high sort of thing to have some sort of ecstasy sort of experience and, you know, interact with the gods or whatever in, in their worldview and things. Yeah, so now with uh, another explanation of the literal stuff of the story, something fascinating is that in, when you would approach uh, international relationships between uh, either people groups like tribes and, and things, or on an even broader scale, where you have like one nation against another nation, literally big people groups, all of that. One of the things that scholars have identified is that one of the key things that you aim for first is food supply and the agriculture. So you wanna take that out and, and somehow solely that in some sort of way so that the people's food supply is depleted so that you can win the, the victory in that area. So now, again, the literal story. So we have that scene. The enemy's creeping through. He's sowing the seed. He's doing his thing of all the weeds and all that. He gets away. And we don't know how long it took other than it must have taken at least a couple weeks, maybe more, because it, the difference between wheat and Darnell doesn't really show again until the fruit starts to show up. That's quite some time where... They've been making plans. They probably have made some accounting for, okay, we have this big of a field. We planted this much seed. So therefore, it's going to be this sort of way. We're going to get this kind of economic growth. I'm going to hire on these employees. They're going to do this job. They're going to go out and they're going to uh, harvest the field and, and tend to the field and different things of that way. And so the workers, they're familiar with this dynamic. They go out and they start to uh, observe the fruit and behold, wow, there's some Darnell. Darn it. Did you catch that? Okay. I was trying. Okay. Here we go. Ah, Darnell. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so they observe, oh my gosh, here's this, this weed. What happened? So then they go back to the, the master, the owner of the field, and they're like, wow are you sure you sowed some good seed? And he's like, it must have been the enemy. And so then they're like, what do you want us to do? Okay, well, uh, don't pull it up because otherwise you're going to pull up the good stuff with the two. Might as well just let it all grow together. And at harvest time, we're going to sort it all out. That's the literal story. Now, for anybody who was on the side of there, they would have been tracking with Jesus the whole time through this whole interaction. Uh, because just like uh, some people used to, you know, uh, pick berries and berry fields and different things and like uh, be workers at harvest time and different situations like that, like you may have at some point in your life, they were tracking. What we don't know is how they interpreted when Jesus was talking about throwing the Darnell into the furnace. We don't know exactly if they made that jump to know about what Jesus explained to the disciples. We don't know also how they would have drawn the parallel between, okay, Jesus, he's talking about a field. I'm tracking. He's talking about seed. Okay, good. I'm talking about weeds now. Oh, we don't want that. And now we're talking about this. Oh, goodness. Let them all grow together. Okay, but now we're talking about the kingdom of heaven because Jesus says at the very beginning of this parable, the kingdom of heaven might be compared to the scenario. And so we're not there yet, but the big idea is still that God's justice at the end gives hope now. And so even in the midst of this terrible situation, if I were a farmer, I imagine I would just be really peeved, and you might be too, at this whole scenario of 
man, I planted good seed. I know I did my due diligence. I went out of my way. I, I picked out that bag of seed. I, I got it. I got all the seed I needed, and I'm, I know I planted the good thing. But yet, here's this, this not good seed growing up in its place. What's going on? How do we even, how do we deal with this type of scenario when we expect life to go one way, but then even in our best efforts, there is some good fruit from that, and there's some good, but then all of a sudden, oh my goodness, there's, there's things that are going the way they should not go, and even uh, in, in a poisonous sort of way. So that brings us to our next slide, and still unpacking kind of now what Jesus unpacks for the disciples, okay? A story of two kingdoms. So again, talking about the kingdom of heaven, place where God is king and God's will is, is perfectly done. Uh, right now, even in that place, you know, that is really only perfectly done in heaven. Uh, you know, we can look around in the world today and see how there's a whole lot in our world that is not God's will and not God's way of doing things and does not reflect his righteousness and his holiness and his, his plan for his kingdom and his purposes for his kingdom to be revealed. And so the disciples, they asked Jesus, will you please unpack this for us? Because I know, we know, you weren't just talking about wheat and weeds. There was something deeper going on here. And so Jesus, he unpacks it for them. He, he talks about uh, the different, um, like what each element of the parable means. What's fascinating is that Jesus brings up a very clear delineation in this parable. There is God's kingdom, and then there's the kingdom of the enemy. In God's kingdom, he sows good seed, and in God's kingdom, he, he means for it to be planted in the world, to, to be a display of his glory here in the world. Even the term for world doesn't just mean somebody's sphere of influence, but it, it literally in the Greek means like the whole globe. God wants his kingdom to be so vast, expansive, that the field that he's talking about is really the whole world would be influenced and come under the rule and reign of God. And then there's the kingdom of the enemy, where the enemy comes in and he's sneaking through and he's trying to sow these different seeds of the evil one. And so we have these two kingdoms. What do we do with them? Do we uproot one at the expense of the other? Jesus would say, no, you let them, you let them uh, go together for some time. Do, do we try to root out the old evil one at, and even try to exterminate? Like maybe we don't root it out, but we use, oh, what's that type of weed killer that you just like you spray on it? Roundup. Oh, I love Roundup. I do. You know what the problem with Roundup is, though, like with all weed killers? It kills all the good stuff around it, right? Now, we're not just talking about weed and weeds, are we? Although we could probably talk all day about, like, the best way for lawn care and all these different types of things. We're talking about this reality that there are two kingdoms at odds with each other fighting for the hearts of the human race. There are two kingdoms. What do we do with that? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the first is that we can see in the passage, Jesus, as he's unpacking the parable, he says, the sower is the son of man. Jesus is the one who is starting the kingdom of God. He's sowing the good seed. He's making sure that uh, that he's faithful to the job that God had given him to do as, as the Messiah, as the one to start this whole kingdom of God thing here on earth. And then he starts it, and now it has some time to grow. 
What's interesting, here's where I might offend some people. There is this phrase that gets used, the end of the age. What do we do with that? I'm glad you asked again. Uh, so, there are a few ideas out there. One is to assume uh, that we are living in what some scholars call the church age, um, and that at the end of the church age, when uh, at some point before uh, things start to get really, really terrible in the world, God will take the church out and will take them to heaven to be with him, and then uh, the whole world will fall into utter chaos, and God will come in at the very end to bring about his rule and reign. The reason I don't particularly like that application of this parable is this. The ones who are removed in the parable are not the sons of righteousness. They're not the children of righteousness. It's not what we would label the church, those who have responded in faith to the Word of God. Who is it? It's the sons of disobedience. It's the sons of the evil one who are removed and then thrown into the fiery furnace, which is a literary type to talk about the idea of eternal torment or, or hell or that kind of thing. And what is characterized by that experience of having been a, a child of the evil one is that you experience this horrific grief and despair and where you're weeping and you're gnashing your teeth because you're so sorrowful over your condition. And Jesus uses that phrase to describe a certain part of eternity for those who have rejected him. At the same time, though, Jesus offers up the, in the original parable, he offers up the destination that for those who would be counted as sons of righteousness, according to how Jesus describes them, they're characterized as the wheat and they are gathered in to the barn at the very end. Now, some scholars think this term end of the age just literally means at the end of all things that we know as of right now. When things reach their final conclusion, and then at that time, at the final judgment, then God's going to sort everything out. And he's going to command his angels, and he's going to say, hey, go round up uh, the weeds, so to speak, the, the sons of the evil one, round them up and, and throw them into the furnace and, and, and make that delineation in that distinction between God's kingdom and the kingdom of the evil one. If this feels like a roly-poly trip, it's because it is, because this is kind of a peek inside my brain as I'm trying to wrestle through this passage because we have these two kingdoms. And a really big problem that we have done as a church, not maybe not our specific church, but the church globally, is that we have done a terrible job at using passages like these because we misuse them. We think, ah, ha, ha, I know what this means. And so then we use this as a weapon against people who might be considered or they wouldn't self-identify as weeds. Who wants to be identified as a weed? Nobody, really. Where, but according to the parable, we, you, we the church, have used this against them. When that's not the purpose of this parable at all, it's meant as a comfort to those who would be considered wheat, as well as a reminder to make doubly sure that our fruit is exhibiting the fruit of the kingdom. How do we do that? Well, like we learned last week, because of this, this parables of fields and there's some crossover in these different things, how we do that is we make sure 
that we are ready to respond to the Word of God, that we are, are bearing fruit according with our repentance, that even though we may say all day that yes, we have repented, and yes, we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, and we're saying all the right things, yet our fruit in our life doesn't actually witness to that. That's a problem. Now, in this passage and in this parable, there is no transformation that Jesus talks about. I'm, I am bringing in from what we've learned in our series so far, that there is a possibility as we respond in faith to Christ that you can receive salvation. You could be counted as a son of righteousness. How? Because at one point, the truth of the matter is we were all sons and daughters of the evil one. It wasn't until we responded in faith to Jesus that we changed our citizenship. It wasn't until we responded in faith to Jesus that a transformation in the heart could take place to where then the seed could take root and then start to transform us from the inside out. The good news is that it's not too late. We have not yet, even some 2,000 plus years later, we have not reached the end of the age. Second Peter says that God is patient and that God doesn't want anybody to not be saved. He wants everybody to be saved. So God, he's extending this out and I'm paraphrasing here, but he's extending it out and he's, he's being patient and, and, and all the while the world's going to, to pot and everything. And yet, he's patient because he has this compassion for the world because he wants the world to be saved. He wants everyone to be able to experience the good of his kingdom. Not be under the rule and reign of the evil one. And so, some application for us with this story of two kingdoms is that you and I need to reflect and think for ourselves, which kingdom do I belong to? And, and we know that by the fruit of our lives. And so between you and the Lord, you think about and you pray about and you ask God, God, would you reveal to me this fruit in my life that either does point to you and your kingdom or it does not. And if it does not, God, would you please help me with that? Would you please transform that in me to align myself with you and your kingdom? Because God's justice at the end gives hope now. Now, let's say you are somebody where you would self-identify as the wheat, and you would self-identify as like, yes, I would count myself among those children of righteousness, so to speak. It gets really frustrating, the thought that the two are together, that we have both the kingdom of God and the here and now, both now and not yet. It's here, it's present, we can experience now, and yet, oh man, there's a whole lot of kingdom of the evil one happening at the same time. Why doesn't God just do something about it? Because God is patient. And although there is the story of two kingdoms, God is willing to hold it in tension for the sake of the good. And yet, he promises that at the end, he will set all the wrong things right. He will make it right. He will make it good. And he will establish his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. You can go to the next slide. So in the meantime, we are together, side by side, with the kingdom of darkness all the time. What do we do with that? The answer is not just to stand in a field and think, God, is it time yet? 
<laughs> I love that. I love, love that show. Um, but, you know, it's not that kind of a response. It's not, again, that whole illustration of the weeds and the wheat. They are together, inextricably, inextricably if that's the right term that I'm using there. They are, they're there, they're growing together at the same time. And it's not until you see the fruit of those kingdoms that you start to realize, ah, ha, ha, here is the kingdom of heaven and here is the kingdom of darkness. What do we do? Because we're together in the waiting. The answer is not to silo ourselves off in monasteries and say, I know that me and my posse, we are wheat. We're going to go over here and we're going to build this building and we're just going to be wheat over here. To hell with those weeds over there. We're just going to be wheat and be really good wheat and show really good wheat fruit in our weedy, weed, wheat, wheat, wheat kind of way. <laughs> Forget those guys. It's not that. It's also not trying to hurt those people over there. What is the job as we are together in the waiting? You can go to the next slide. Our job as wheat is to witness to the grower, so to speak. <clears throat> Our job is to be a witness to the hope that is inside of us. It is not our job to go around taking Bibles and beating people over the head with them. It is not our job to take parables like the parable of the wheat and the weeds and put it on some kind of sandwich board sign and walk around a parade being like, I hope you're wheat. <laughs> That's not our job. You might think it's your job, but friends, let me tell you with clarity that is not your job according to this parable. Your job is simply to grow and to grow well. To enter into discipleship and let your spiritual life grow in such a way that the Holy Spirit that's inside of you starts to show up in all kinds of cool ways, first in character, and then maybe in some kind of a cool way, like when we pray for somebody, they might get healed. Maybe when we pray for somebody, they might have some kind of a, a spiritual breakthrough in their life. When we pray for people, or when we're just around people, maybe we just encourage somebody with a, a kind word or, or whatever, that we get to see the kingdom of God show up here and now. That is our job. It's not to silo ourselves off. It's to get out there and be salt and light in the world. Both to be an influence and also a beacon of light to say, hey, the kingdom of God, it's real. I've experienced it in my life. Now, maybe you're, you're that wild and crazy, and that's okay. God loves you too. Sometimes, uh, for the rest of us, we're, we're really subdued, and we just like to go about our life in a quiet sort of manner. That's okay too. The point is that we are to be a witness. I believe... That's where the parable of the sower leads us today. Because in its original context, people would have known when Jesus said end of the age, he was talking about end times things. When God comes to set all things right. They weren't thinking about all the different theologies that we've developed since then to try to wrap our minds around that. They just know that God will set things right, period. Period. And at that time, this will happen. And there were different prophecies that all fed into that idea. Then when the disciples went to Jesus, then they get the clearer 
kind of zoomed in picture a little bit to see, oh, oh, those are what those elements mean. And then when we get to the moment where you and I hear these words today, friends, take courage, take heart. When things are difficult, and it's difficult to live the life of a Christian, have hope that even though we are in that uncomfortable place where the kingdom of God is coexisting alongside the kingdom of darkness and both kingdoms are growing at the same time, have hope that God will set everything right. It may not feel that way right now. It might not feel that way when you hear of all kinds of legislation, all kinds of social practices, all kinds of whatever that might just fly in the face of a biblical value of righteousness. It's okay for things to not be okay because God is letting it happen even though we wished he wouldn't. And we'd wish, man, God, can't you just take care of this now so we can get to forever already? And we feel that way. But remember, friends, God is patient and he wants everybody to be saved. The more the merrier in the kingdom. And so God's justice at the end, God is just. He's not going to let these things just slip by. God's justice at the end, it's meant to give us hope now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have a plan. And I'm so grateful that you have a purpose in mind and that you're not willing that any should perish. You're not willing that any should have to endure that, that suffering at the end and for all time. God, you want everyone to find a saving knowledge of you and, and to be brought into relationship with you so you can to show how your yoke is easy and your burden is light and how the good of your kingdom is actually for our good. God, help us to see that. God, if there's things in our life that need to come into alignment with you, God, so we can to bear better fruit, help us to do that. We want to be holy as you are holy. And we want that to be more than just lip service. God, we want to be set apart for you. We want to experience the favor that comes by being children of righteousness. And yet, God, even at the same time, you modeled for us, Jesus, that even as in that place of righteousness, that you modeled a way to love those who don't agree with you necessarily, and maybe the fruit of their life don't, does not attest to the kingdom of God quite yet. God, in this, in this place in the waiting, please help us. Help us be sensitive to where you are leading us. Help us to be sensitive to what you're calling us to do. God, we want to honor you with our lives. We want to witness to your great news. Help us. We can't do it on our own. It's not our job to do it on our own. It's just our job to respond in faith to you and to let you do the shining and the displaying and the witnessing in our lives. God, we yield to you these things. We pray for those who don't agree with us. And God, we ask that you would humble our hearts in a way that would help to show our devotion to you and would help to show your kingdom even to people who, who don't think the same way we do and might come to different conclusions than we might. Holy Spirit, would you lead us in your way? 
It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, would you stand with me? It has been good to be here with you all. As we go from this place and we go out into the world, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.